Th this is true in the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Holland, all of Scandinavia. You guys border on Canada, right? Well, it is true in Canada as well. They have had a system of universal health care for many decades now. And I border on, I live 50 miles away from the Canadian border near Quebec. Now, it seems to me that when we look at the needs of the American people, we should decide whether or not we believe this. But I'll tell you what I believe. I believe that health care is a right for all people, not just the privilege. And if elected president together, we are going to pass a Medicare for all health care program. And when we do that, because right now we pay by far the highest costs, we spend far more for health care per capita than any other country on earth. We can save middle class families thousands of dollars a year by moving toward a Medicare for all system. But in addition to that, this is what we do. Think about what this means. Think about an America where anybody and everybody can go to the doctor when they need to go and not worry about whether they don't have insurance or whether they have a deductible or a copayment. Think about an America where people can get the prescription drugs they need and not be ripped off by the drug companies. Right now in our country, the drug companies charge us by far the highest prices in the world for medicine. By far. A Medicare for all single payer system will end that. I am a member of the U.S. Senate Committee on the Environment. In my view, having talked to scientists all over this country and all over the world, the debate is over. Climate change is real. It is caused by human activity and it is already causing devastating problems in our country and around the world. In my view, we have a moral responsibility to leave this planet in a way that is healthy and habitable for our kids and future generations. Now, I am more than aware that North Dakota is a fossil fuel state. I have, and that there are a whole lot of those communities that lost jobs as a result of this energy transformation. $41 billion. Our job our goal is not to punish the workers, it is to save this planet. <laughs> this campaign is listening to people whose voices are not often heard. We are listening to our brothers and sisters in the African American community. And they are asking me why it is that we have trillions of dollars to fight a war in Iraq we never should have gotten into. A war that I vigorously opposed, but they are asking how do we have trillions for a war in Iraq but we don't have enough money to rebuild the inner cities of America.
and they are right. This campaign is listening to our brothers and sisters in the Latino community. And they remind us there are 11 million people in this country who are undocumented, who are being exploited every day, because when you are a worker and you have no legal rights, your employer takes advantage of you. And that is why we need a path towards citizenship through comprehensive immigration reform. And this campaign, this campaign is listening to a people whose pain is almost never heard, and that is people in the Native American community. Now, all of you know, all of you know, all of you know that from before this country was a country, when the first settlers came here, the Native American people were lied to, they were cheated, and treaties they negotiated were broken. You also know that our culture and some of the best parts of our nation are indebted to the wisdom and the work of the Native American people. <laughs> in fact, in my view, we owe the Native American people a debt that we can never fully repay. They have taught us so much. And the most important thing, I believe, that they have taught us is that as human beings, we are part of nature. That we must, that we must coexist with nature. And that if we destroy nature, you know what we're doing? We are destroying the human species. We're destroying ourselves. But yet, despite all they have done, in many reservations and Native American communities, the situation of the Native American people today is absolutely dire. I was, I was yesterday in Pine Ridge in South Dakota. What I saw there is literally beyond belief. What I saw there, and, and I realize that Pine Ridge is not unique, that there are reservations around the country also where the unemployment rate is unbelievably high, poverty rate high, drug abuse off the charts, young people killing themselves in horrific numbers. We, together, if elected president, will fundamentally change our relationship to the Native American people in this country. Real change, as everybody here knows or should know, never takes place from the top on down. It's never some president signing a document. Real change takes place when millions of people stand up, fight back, and demand that change. Yeah. When workers in America 100 plus years ago were forced to work seven days a week, 12 hours a day, when kids, little children were in the factories and lost their fingers and their hands, working people said, you know what? Workers will have dignity on the job. We are gonna organize trade unions. And I thank the workers for doing that. In the worst and ugliest moments of slavery in this country, there were African Americans and their allies 
who stood together. They were beaten, they were killed, they went to jail. But they stood together and said that the day will come in this country when racism and bigotry will end. People forget this. Many children in school don't even know this. Less than a hundred years ago, not a long time, women in America did not have the right to vote, did not have the right to get the education they wanted or the jobs they wanted. Whole sections of our society were denied to women. And the establishment and the system said to women, your place is at home having babies. That's what you're supposed to do. But women stood up and fought back. And they said, they said, you will not define my life to me. I will define my life and what I want to do. And millions of women and their male allies made it clear that in this country, women would, will not be second class citizens. But that took enormous struggle. Nobody gave it to women. Think about how difficult that struggle was, not only standing up and fighting the establishment, but redefining one's role in society. And then if we were here, I'll give you another example, 10 years ago, no time at all, somebody jumps up and says, you know, Bernie, I think that by the year, say, 2015, gay marriage will be legal in every state in this country. The person next to her would have said, you're crazy. There is too much bigotry and homophobia in America. It cannot be accomplished. But the gay community and their straight allies stood up, fought back, organized and said that in America, people should have the right to love whoever they wanted to, regardless of their gender. That's how change, the gay community and their straight allies stood up, fought back, organized and said that in America, people should have the right to love whoever they wanted to, regardless of their gender. That's how change, that's how change comes about. Let me give you an even more contemporary situation. If we were here five years ago, five years ago, no time at all, somebody jumps up says, you know, Bernie, this federal minimum wage of $7.25 an hour is a starvation wage. You got to, we have to raise that minimum wage to $15 an hour. Now, the person next to him would have said, 15 bucks an hour? You're crazy, man. You know, it's seven and a quarter. You want to more than double that? What are you, what are you smoking? You know, what are you... You know, you're too radical, you're really crazy. Maybe we can raise the minimum wage to $8 possible, nine, 10, who knows? But $15 an hour, never! But what happened? Three years ago, workers in the fast food industry, in McDonald's, in Burger King, in Wendy's, you know what? They went out on strike. They demonstrated, they stood up and they fought back. And then, a couple of years ago, in Seattle, Washington, they raised the minimum wage 15 bucks an hour. San Francisco, Los Angeles. That is how change always takes place. 
when people stand up, reject the status quo, and fight back. And here we are at this moment in this campaign, and I've been all over this country, you know, from California to Maine, and I have seen people looking around them and saying, wait a minute, why is it that in America we have massive levels of income and wealth inequality? Why is it that I am working longer hours for low wages and almost all new income is going to the top 1%? Why is it that the middle class has been disappearing for 30 years? Why are we the only major country on earth that doesn't provide paid family and medical leave, doesn't provide health care to all people? Why do we have the highest rate of childhood poverty of almost any major city? Why are our inner cities throughout this country and our infrastructure collapsing? Why? And people are beginning to catch on. That once you start asking those questions, once you start getting involved politically, what seemed so hard yesterday will not be so hard tomorrow. The same thing with all of the other struggles for workers' rights, for civil rights, for women's rights, for gay rights. What we're fighting for now is a country and a government that works for all of us, not just the 1%. Now, on June 7th, North Dakota and seven other states, six, I'm sorry, five other states will be having primaries and caucuses. What we have learned throughout this campaign is we do well and we win when voter turnout is high. I hope, now Minnesota already voted. All right. And we won Minnesota big. So if we could do it in Minnesota, we could do it in North Dakota. So I hope very much that on June 7th there will be a very, very large turnout at your caucus. And I hope that this beautiful state, and is, you know, we've driven around it a little bit, what a beautiful state you have, that this beautiful state this beautiful state will join many other states in the fight for the political revolution. Thank you all very much. This has been a WDAY WDAZ special report.